Okay, my name is Rich Schmidt. I'm here with Jay McDonald. We're at EIEIO in Carleton. It's July 1st, 2020. Jay, thanks so much for joining us today. Hi. Thanks for having me. Uh, first question, as you know from having seen some interviews before, is why wine? Oh, uh, why wine? Uh, probably because I enjoyed drinking it. Uh, even as an underage person, I would have access to not great wine, but you know, twice a year the parents would have wine at the uh, major meals, uh, Thanksgiving and Christmas. And uh, they give you a little bit, and uh, you know, you'd like it. And then as things went on, uh, I was the person in college who had wine in the fridge instead of beer. Uh, not good wine, but grocery store level wine. And uh, beer as well, but it's like, okay, interesting to learn. And then when I got out in the working world, I had access to an expense account. And that's how you learn about wine. <laughs> when someone else is paying for it. Uh, and it was one of those things where you kind of go, wow, there's a major difference between these two wines from the same place. Mm -hmm. And then you look at the same vintage or the same winemaker with different vineyards or whatever they're doing. And that was in my late 20s when that really came into the, like an epiphany of there's a difference. And I didn't really notice it before. I just noticed that it was fun. Mm -hmm. Uh, the person I worked for in New York, he also had uh, quite a extent, major wine cellar and he would share once a month or so some nice wines and then he learned even more about that. And then uh, when I turned early 30s, you, you'd kind of uh, go, wow, I don't want to do what I'm doing forever. Uh, not fun anymore, uh, too hard to compete. And I was in New York at the time and so I said, okay, what do you want to do? So I traveled uh, the U.S. only for about nine months mm -hmm. and went to the North Fork of Long Island. I uh, went down to outside of Austin, Texas, the Texas Hill Country, a wine region there was just starting or kind of emerging. Mm -hmm. This is early uh, 1990, 91. Uh, and then I came up here and uh, it was blown away. It was uh, November of 91. And beautiful scenery, even though it was drizzly and rainy. Uh, I wasn't talking about the wine business at the time, I just saw the place and then I came back again with a full force in uh, 93 and met with several people in the business and uh, they were more or less saying, if you want to move here and have this skill set, we'll set you up in business. This is what we want you to do for us. We're not going to pay you, but this is what we want you to do for us. And that's when I started uh, the Taste Room in Carleton. Mm -hmm. So it was a retail wine shop that had wines from the Oregon wineries that at the time were closed to the public. And they weren't closed because they wanted to be, they closed because husband and wife, raising children, farming, making wine, you know, doing all to get things going. So I had uh, some very nice wines uh, from great wineries and uh, the business grew and all of them helped me uh, to learn how to, more about wine so I was more effective at selling it. I never sold anything before. I was. It was all new to me, and uh, I wasn't that good the first few years, but that's okay, you know, you learn. And then uh, by working in the other wineries, both in production, uh, viticulturally, and other aspects, you learn the words you need to know, what it means, uh, and then effectively how to sell, and, yeah. and, uh, and it worked out fine. And the business grew, and Carlton grew, uh, when I came to Carleton, Pine Street was uh, gravel, and uh, Main Street, I was on the corner there, uh, Pine and Main, was paved. And uh, it was kind of fun, because I would say 20% of the town was boarded up, and uh, the town had great potential. And it's one of the few real towns, you know, that's still, in, in, uh, hasn't been ruined by ODOT, let me put it that way, yet. Uh, and the town grew around me with the wine business too. Uh, Ken Wright and Domain Serene were there uh, when I opened up. So at the same time they moved there, I moved there. And then uh, Bel Pont, mm -hmm. outside outskirts, and now there's 23, I think, tasting rooms in Carleton. Uh, so the big change happened for me actually in 2008. Uh, I'd been making wine uh, at different places, just on the side, not really making, making, not legally making it, but you know, assisting. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then 2003, I actually started uh, EIEIO, and uh, I was one of the 
AP licenses, early uh, Ultimate Proprietorship mm -hmm. uh, with Josh Bergstrom. And then I uh, went off on my own in 2008. And so that was also the transition when the economy collapsed. What great timing. <laughs> so uh, I had a rented building in downtown Carlton, the old post office, it was where my winery was at the time. And that proved to be too small. And then there was lots of space available because of the economy collapsing. Uh, and then slowly the wineries who I represented wanted to take back the wine sales because they could make a better profit. Mm -hmm. And they needed to because, you know, everything was collapsing. And I know what feeling, it's had a great run for several years. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I moved to uh, a winery in Dayton, uh, the Methvin facility, with other five or six other winemakers down there. Mm -hmm. We all kind of shared the facility. A lot like the studio in Carlton, but not quite as organized as the studio in Carlton. <laughs> but it worked out fine. And then uh, I built this winery here in 2017. And so far, so good. Yeah. So let's go back up to a little bit to, to starting the tasting room. Mm -hmm. um, tell me about the initial, your initial impressions of Oregon wine and of the people whose wines you were selling and what you were, what you were looking for in those wines and how you were selling them. Good, good question. Uh, I remember one part very well because everyone was very enthusiastic in helping me learn how to taste mm -hmm. and what Oregon wine is because I was definitely in the lower end of the spectrum as far as wine uh, purchasing and wine drinking goes. And at the time, the vintage that was being released was a 91, a uh, great vintage. Uh, 90 was also available and it was both of those wines were, well 90 especially was pretty, pretty tannic. Uh, and then the 91 was very acidic. And I asked the question during one of the tastings, I said, are the wines supposed to be this acidic? They're supposed to be like this because it was you know, a big change from drinking Merlot and Zinfandel and, and you know more more accessible, uh, affordable wines. Mm -hmm. And Steve Dorner was in the group, you know, helping me with stuff. Uh, and we weren't drinking his wines. I think we drank, I think we're drinking his ninety threes. Uh, and it was kind of fascinating to sit and talk with people and learn from the ones who have been here. And then Dickie Rath was in the group as well. And not as I represented his wines, they were already established, but it was, he was very instrumental in just being a helpful person. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So as you learned to sell, uh, what, what was, how did you get people to come to Carlton? How did you find, Carlton was still such a young wine spot at that point, in such a young town, in some, or undeveloped town, I guess, in yeah. some ways. Yeah. How did people find you, and how did you kind of grow the business? It was tough. Uh, when I first started with the building in Carlton, everyone said, why you don't, what, Carlton's out of the way, you should be in Newburgh, McMinnville, Dundee. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, the research I've done, I said, if you're a 99, that's a potty stop, either on the way to the coast or the way back from the coast. And I don't want to be that, I want to be a destination, mm -hmm. and I'll make it happen. And so through tenacity and then other people helping me, uh, I had uh, wine made for me, let's call them shiners. And on the label, I put a map of where Carlton was. Uh, the label on the front had a, a line drawing of the building, so it was very obvious the building you needed to look for in Carlton. <laughs> and, uh, and so I'd give those away to the restaurants. There were maybe 10 B&Bs here at the time, mm -hmm. uh, and even the hotel motels just say, here, if anybody comes in, you know, that's just into the wine, send them to me. And also the wineries that are represented, they would send me business when they didn't have time to deal with uh, mm -hmm. the direct customers mm -hmm. anyway. So that's the way it kind of worked. But yeah, going to all the different B&Bs and finding them and giving away wine, you're thinking, what am I doing? It's like, I just, I just gave away all this wine. It cost me money. Well, anyway, it all, it all worked out. What would, what did you, you mentioned some of the, or kind of the early names, you, people you met and, and were in this group and kind of uh, influential people in, in that time in Oregon wine. Tell me what your impressions of the industry were at that time. I mean, was it, did it feel like a cohesive industry? Did it feel like a, a business? What, what did it feel like as you came into it? Yeah, well being, uh, I noticed everyone being very helpful to, even though you're a competitor, uh, working during harvest at different places. And I worked for Kenwright uh, back in uh, 95 and 96. Uh, and then before that, I was with a group of home winemakers who ended up making their own winery uh, later. I was with uh, Peter Rossback of mm -hmm. Chenin. Mm -hmm. He was in a home wine group, as well as uh, Brian and Joe O'Donnell from Belpont. 
uh, and it was just a fun group. And then, but what, when you work in the actual winery, you know, something would go wrong, or you know, I didn't know what was going wrong because I didn't know anything. But the person who owned it, the winemaker, or whatever, did, and they would call somebody, and they'd come over and say, "Oh yeah, this is what you do, blah blah." blah. Or, we need a piece of equipment. Ours broke, and they would bring it over into the day. So it was very much a uh, an understanding that you know, a rising tide helped everybody. Mm -hmm. And uh, the same with going back to Ken Wright. You know, he was probably one of the first to really focus on just doing single vineyard wines, mm -hmm. and he also was focusing on texture more so than flavor. This is back then when he went from Panther Creek to Kenwright. Mm -hmm. And I think that people kind of caught on to that because in sales, when you're pouring the wine and paying attention to the customer, it's subjective to say red cherry, black cherry, raspberry, you know, strawberry. Mm -hmm. But texture is not really that subjective. It's fairly obvious if a wine is acidic or tannic or is smooth or rough. And that's one of those things where it's, oh, that's a good idea to focus on something that is more of a universal thing mm -hmm. instead of a graduate level, I understand wine sort of thing. But talk about your sort of your development of wine education because you, you took an interesting route into it. At what point did you feel confident in talking about wines this way? At what point did you feel graduate level, as it were, I still in, don't. in wine? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I would say. After about 10 years, yeah, I took a lot of classes, uh, and one of the best classes that I still take about every three years is uh, wine spoilage classes, which is uh, you go and sit in a room and they've got five glasses in front of you, maybe six, increasing levels of whatever the spoilage bacteria is or the problem might be, and at what point can you detect it, mm -hmm. you know, aromatically and texturally. And it's kind of interesting because you meet people next to you who pick it up at parts per billion. I don't get it to parts per million and say, hey, what's your name? You know, come to my cellar because I might have this problem and not realize it. Uh -huh. And so that sort of thing. So at what point did you decide that uh, you wanted to make wine? And you, you talked about kind of make, starting EIAO. What was the impetus to that? Working with people and seeing how, well, the camaraderie is fantastic during harvests especially, uh, and just watching it evolve and move. Uh, it's one of those little things you, you, you learn. You're taught, I think, incorrectly. I took the distance learning program at UC Davis, never finished. But it's kind of funny how they're teaching you things which are, are true uh, in theory. And one thing that I've found out is you cannot control organic chemistry. You're just, you just think you can. Uh, most of it, everything's a variable, and there is no constant. And if you try to, only constant I can control really is cleanliness, and cleanliness is a relative thing. So, yeah, that's about it. So as you got as you got interested in it, tell me about the the first wines you made, uh, find figuring out what you wanted to make, where you wanted to make them, how you wanted to make them. What was the sort of process for you in starting this label? Uh, the first wine I ever made, I didn't really make it. I just had a yellow pad on a clipboard that at what time of the day to do what because it was this was a uh, 93 vintage we picked the grapes i probably shouldn't say this well i'll say it now lynn and i are friends uh lynn at the time was at rex hill and she was leasing uh the marsh vineyard over in dundee and uh, old man marsh and uh, he just he liked brian and jill o'donnell and therefore i'm part of this group he said come over and just pick one cluster from each plant they're never gonna know. <laughs> so we did. And uh, in 93, I had this clipboard and they had, both of them had jobs and Jill drove all the way to Vancouver, Washington to work for HP. And Brian worked for Intel at the big campus in Hillsboro. And they would get up, milk these damn goats and then say, hey Jay, here's what you're doing today. And it was 30 minute you know, increments of mm -hmm. what to do, what to measure. Uh, and we made some pretty good wine. Or I followed directions really well, let's put it that way. <laughs> uh, and then we did 94. And the 94 was a very easy vintage to make wine compared to 93, and the wine didn't turn out so well. It's one of those things where it's very humbling because you get uh, too much confidence, I think, if you're successful the first time around. And that was quite humbling. And, and I think that that helps now going forward because remember that? Remember that back in 94? Oh man. That was a great vintage, and you screwed it all up. You know? <laughs> yeah. 
uh, as you were as you were growing the your label, making more wine, where where were you where were you looking for grapes? And was it always did you have an idea that it was going to be Pinot Noir? Did you have an idea of doing other things? Like what was the kind of what was the plan? I guess with with EIEIO. Uh, that was the name of the winery initially. I had several names before then. Uh, the name came to be during a family dinner. Of course. And uh, inebriated. And <laughs> sometimes good ideas come to you when you're drunk. Very, very seldom. But uh, this was one of them that worked. But uh, the idea of just making wine, I didn't know where I wanted to be, what grapes. So specifically, I just well, I toured around, like I said, for mm -hmm. nine plus months to see who was doing what mm -hmm. and get the feel of the place and, and also get the the parameters of what it would cost to get in. Uh, and they also had great data here. Uh, Oregon State had a book that they put out and they updated, I guess, for once in a while. I've got three or four copies of each new edition mm -hmm. of what it cost. And they have a big spreadsheet. You can kind of figure things mm -hmm. out. But uh, I have yet to plant because I can't see the economics of uh, planting a vineyard. It would stroke my ego substantially to have my own vineyard, but I don't think it would make better wine or and I would go bankrupt faster so you know we don't want that <laughs> but yeah I didn't I didn't choose Pinot Noir I just was here and the people here were the most embracing of everywhere what I met I also went to Mendocino County in California and Sonoma County mm. Sonoma I couldn't afford and Mendocino I thought was too far away from civilization to really make any sales you know happen so once you decided here and you decided on Pinot where did you look for Pinot Noir, where did, what, did you have a certain? That's a logging truck. There's some clear cutting right up there. You get a panorama <laughs> right there. Yeah. Did Did you have a certain uh, vineyard type in mind, a soil type, elevation, anything like that at the start? That's another good question. Uh, uh, when I moved here, and I was looking to buy land, I didn't have that kind of money. I barely had enough money to buy the building in downtown Carlton, and you would hear everybody say you have to have jewelry soil. Joyce was the only thing that works, let me tell you. And this is what David Lett was telling me, and he and I got along fairly well because we were both, I was a young curmudgeon and he was an older curmudgeon. But uh, it, then the 94 vintage happened and it was reviewed in 96, and every single of the higher scoring wines by the critics was all on Willa Kinsey soil. Well, everybody said, wait, well, hey, gotta do Willa Kinsey. You know, Jory's done. You gotta have Willa Kinsey. It's like, wow, how could that happen so fast in the period of three years? And you do more research and you go, hey, look, all these wines that got these high scores, Willa Kinsey soil, were all young vines. Mm hmm. Mm. Well, so maybe that's something to do with it because it's what the media at the time, the critics at the time, liked that more forward style. But then, you know, now you look at what's happening, you know, you've got pea vine, you've got galetli, you've got nakaya or nakia, however you pronounce it, all these different soil types. I think anything will work. We're not going to know for a hundred plus years what really works the best. And that's why it's also fun because everybody's doing different things and you plant a vineyard and this side of the vineyard is in this kind of soil and this is that side and it makes a totally different wine. And that's one thing that fascinated me about Pinot because you can really taste that there's a difference in what happened with the weather you can kind of guess on uh the soil type you can't really guess that much on i think i can but i'm, I'm, I'm probably fooling myself uh but wine making styles big imprint uh on, on pinot noir how would you describe your winemaking style while making philosophy i changed my style in 2008 was the last year i used uh, a full extraction method called the guillacad method uh it was in vogue at the time and after that, uh, I pulled back. So 2009 forward, uh, no yeast, no enzymes, uh, no SO2, except once it's already finished in barrel, finished with secondary. So it's, it's high risk, but I look upon harvest as having a, a newborn and it's over in two months versus 20 years. So, you know, you don't, you're sleep deprived for two, two and a half months, but you can get through it. And it's fun, you know it's going to all work out. So you, I'm down here probably every four hours. Mm -hmm. uh, and I do have people come and, and help. It's not just me alone here uh, during harvest. And it's a good crew. We've got a lot of people who have come back, one person 15 years in a row. Mm -hmm. uh, and another, he's my distributor actually in, in uh, Iowa, a guy named John Phelan. And then uh, other people who have you know, come and gone, learning more, more things, younger people. And then... Uh, it worked out well. Yeah. 
So you mentioned a couple of things. You mentioned early on, kind of screwing up. It should have been a, a, an easy harvest. And, and what were the what were the lessons you learned from that? And and how do you get from I messed up this harvest. It should have been fairly easy. To I'm going to take this kind of high risk style with my wine uh, a few years later, a few years down the road from that. I think it was was again is cleanliness. And so keeping things clean, there's always going to be enough bacteria, the good bacteria that is, to ferment uh, the grapes we have here. Unless somebody sprayed a bunch of copper sulfate to near harvest or whatever that's going to stifle or stunt whatever native yeast you have. Uh, but I just feel that if you keep everything clean, I mean, I don't mean just the winery, but the tanks, the hoses, the punch down tools, you know, whatever you're using, the pumps. Mm -hmm. and you're almost anal in your cleanliness that it, it works because there's stuff floating in and out because it's everywhere you know uh, and I think that's what went wrong with the uh, 94 vintage mm -hmm. and you know we were making it in those 18 inch tall bins with plastic liners and we had bed sheets <laughs> to keep the fruit flies out and you know we've moved on from there <laughs> uh, uh, you know I've got these screens that go on top of this thing that's still fermenters that let all the alcohols, the harsh alcohols escape, mm -hmm. but the fruit flies can't get in. Mm -hmm. And uh, you, know, you just keep everything as clean as you can, but let it breathe. So you make, I know you have Pinot, Chardonnay. Yep. Uh, have you ever, are there other varietals that interest you? Are there other things you've, you've wanted to try or have yeah, to Yeah, I want to try something new. I just got offered last night uh, access to some uh, Cab Franc. Uh, I might do that. I don't know. Mm -hmm. uh, probably not this year, due to the whole impending economic disaster that we're supposedly going to see. I don't know. Uh, I'd rather stick with what I know mm -hmm. and uh, sell what I've got instead of going, well, that didn't work. <laughs> There's five <laughs> barrels uh, no, down the drain. Yeah. But yeah, uh, I would like to try something different. I would really like to try different clones of Chardonnay. So mostly what you have access to here in Oregon are a limited number of clones. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And uh, there's so many new ones out there that I think would be great to do like a, just a one acre vineyard of every single clone you could get your hands on and, uh, and see what it does, see what it makes. So let's talk about selling wine. Obviously you had a selling, you were selling wine before you were making wine, which is a nice advantage to have, I suppose. Yeah. Uh, but starting your own thing and selling wine, tell me about that, about finding customers, developing those relationships, develop, getting your wine out there. When I started, I, I did things twofold. I had uh, a small portfolio of wines. I was trying, Oregon wines, established wineries. Uh, maybe not really established so much, but, but they were you know, more so than EIO. <laughs> Uh, and I would go to different states that they weren't in, uh, in my car, station wagon at the time, and land, uh, try to land distributors. Mm -hmm. uh, during this drive around counterclockwise around the U.S., it took me six to eight weeks to do, and I would line up with customers I already had direct sales. Mm -hmm. So they would do dinners at their homes or at their country club or dinner club or, or something, a restaurant, private room, and that would pay for the trip. So that's why I did it the first quarter of every year for several years until I got to the point where I'm too old to do this. You know, this is a lot of work. Uh, and what I found was, was successful was doing the sales to, to the end users. Mm -hmm. Selling to distributors, they always want more. And I think if you even gave them one for free and said, here's $50 cash, they still wouldn't sell it. <laughs> yeah. And I think it's because of regulation. They don't, they don't have to do anything. Mm -hmm. And they're guaranteed a margin just by being part of the equation. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a need for distrib distribution, but not a need for the regulated way that they have, st can stay in business. Mm -hmm. The ones that are successful, they actually sell product, they, they deserve whatever margin they can make. But most of them, and I mean 95%, most of them, they're box movers. <laughs> it's depressing. Mm -hmm. yeah. So as you make that realization, how do you shift your sales from trying to, trying to land distributors to trying to get wine directly to the customer? Uh, 
having the tasting room, I accumulated quite a massive email list because I had a number of different wines and some people only want one specific wine because they like that style or because it's really hard to get or whatever the story may be, but they're still on the list. And then you start selling your wine and you know, they like you and stuff. And so and they like your wine, hopefully. And it grows that way. And most of the additional sales or customers I've, I've had here since being here, uh, since 2017 is word of mouth. Mm -hmm. And not only word of mouth customers, but word of mouth wineries. So other wineries who we get along, we're friends, mm -hmm. we play together, we drink together, eat together. They'll say, hey, you need to go to EIO, you know, because he's doing a great job. And mm -hmm. so it's, once again, everybody's helping everybody else out. Mm -hmm. And now the benefit I've seen with the regulation regarding how we can taste and stuff, I think everybody is pushing towards appointment only. Mm -hmm. And I've always been that way. Mm -hmm. uh, because of regulation, once again, Yamaha County and the zoning I've got here, conditional use permit, I have to have it be appointment only because of they did me a favor and everything's fine. So now that everybody's appointment only, it's not that hard, not difficult to make plans instead mm -hmm. of just showing up. Mm -hmm. And those who do come and have an appointment, I think they're, they're more serious. As mm -hmm. customers, they're, they're buyers, they're not just drinkers. So you talked about your kind of your style and philosophy earlier. What would be the ultimate like takeaway someone would have from a bottle of your wine? What would be the ultimate compliment someone could pay you after drinking some of your wine? Buying more. <laughs> that's, 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 that's real. It's a, a good compliment. Yeah. Uh, I think you probably expect me to say the comparative analysis is some benchmark wine, but uh, but that's not neither here nor there. I think what really is a good sign is if they say you changed me from drinking this wine to drinking your wine and I like your wine better because of whatever their reasons may be. Once again, very subjective. Uh, and he, he, everybody has their own palate. So that's, that's what I think it boils down to. As you've, you've seen, dealt with the customers for a number of years, pre and post EIAO uh, starting. So tell me about how Oregon wine customers have changed and, and I assume in the early days there was a lot of wine education there was a lot of uh, telling people the kind of the basics has that changed do you have a more advanced customer now yes uh, Oregon when I started uh, in 93 here it was more or less unknown uh, there were some I would say there were a third of the wines here were good a third were passable and a third were not and now all the wines are quite good and some are different than others, but I think everybody's making better wine now. Uh, they're growing better grapes now. Uh, the weather's better. Shh. <laughs> Don't say that. Uh, except for this year, it's really odd. It's raining on July 1st. It's raining on July 1st. How weird is that? That happened, I think, in 96, last time I remember. We had rain in July. Uh, I think we had some 93 as well. If this is 93, I'll take 93. 96, uh, not so much. Uh, I think that the consumers at the early days, when they had the tasting room, they, were, they knew Oregon, they knew what quality was, they knew and they would buy lots of wine mm -hmm. and expensive wines. The wines were, at the time, the benchmark wines of Oregon. Uh, what was telling to me and i know people laugh when i say this but it's you can ask other wine really a good question to ask the next person you interview that's been around a while when the movie sideways came out wineries sold out of three vintages in one year yeah the sideways effect and the shop was doing crazy business and that was that uh, i think that year after the sideways came out that was probably the highest gross i've ever done i never even matched it that's how I could afford this farm for that one year. It was incredible. And uh, you hate to say it, but it's, it's, you know, people are really susceptible to whatever is in fashion. And thank God, Pinot Noir is still in fashion. <laughs> because it wasn't before the movie Sideways came out. Uh, and I, you always hear people saying, oh, it's the maturation of the American palate. And now we understand that wine goes with meals and blah, blah. Well, let's hope that's true. Because uh, I'm doing very well, even though restaurants are closed down. Uh, some are opening back up. But I, last year, anyway, I was doing very well with restaurants and country clubs uh, with my wine. Uh, bottle shops. 
I'm doing well at about five bottle shops in the, in the entire U.S. Mm. And uh, they have to hand sell it because it's an unknown. Mm. You know, there's no advertising. I can give you a T-shirt. How about that? Yeah. <laughs> uh, but that's yeah. It'd be an honor. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So you talked about uh, you talked about Pinot Noir coming into fashion and, and, and kind of taking taking it by storm. Uh, tell me about how your business has grown. Uh, you obviously started very small. Tell me about the maturation of this business and is it where you want it to be? Do you have sort of plans to go somewhere else with it in the future? Yeah, uh, I think that what the change that happened with me was initially. You read books, I worked at different wineries and to get different ideas, and there's no right or wrong way to make wine. It's just whatever your technique is versus yours. And mm -hmm. even if you copy styles, your wine's gonna be different because you know, did you punch down clockwise or counterclockwise? That makes a difference. You know, how early did you start? How long? What size hose diameter do you have? Do you have back pressure? Do you have a big hose or a skinny hose? All these oh, everything everything matters. Everything makes a difference. So you look at that and you pick out what you think is the best practice from each person and you end up having your own style, let's call it. Uh, but then I think what's also fascinating now looking at it backwards is that when I started, I just would purchase barrels from one Cooper, whatever the current Cooper that was in fashion at the time. <laughs> and then you kind of go, wait a minute, you know, someone else is doing this and someone else is doing that. So you start saying, okay, Maybe I shouldn't do this. And now I usually buy uh, 20 new barrels a year from 10 different Coopers. And I just get whatever house style is. And because I don't want to tell them to custom make a barrel for me, which mm -hmm. is, doesn't go with what their style is in mm -hmm. their Coopers. So mm -hmm. the other benefit is the Coopers always come here to see what you're doing with their barrels. And then they take you to lunch or dinner so I can get 10 free dinners. <laughs> Versus one, if I go with one Cooper. Yeah. You gotta make money somehow, or save money somehow. And you get lots of swag. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> so, uh, what's your production size? Uh, about 2,200 cases. The most I ever did was in uh, 2017. Another thing in hindsight you see as a mistake. So, in 17, I had my own winery for the first time, uh, this little 1,200 square foot building, and at the time, there was lots of uh, inexpensive grapes. Uh, we could even call them free. I felt guilty, but I paid for picking cost, uh, tax, and delivery. And it ended up being a bad idea, because even though it was free, you have to sell the stuff. And plus, you have to have more fermenters, more barrels, more, more barrel racks, more bungs, more of everything. And it all fit in here. We were stacked up fairly high, packed with barrels in here. But got it all done, and then the thing is, yes, Jay, you have demand for 2,000 cases, uh, not three. So what are you going to do extra 1,000 cases now? Mm. Oh, very, very big mistake. But I'll get rid of it. Maybe next week. Uh, obviously, you mentioned earlier about Carlton's, uh, the change in Carlton since you've been here and the, and the growth here. And you said, I think, 20-some tasting rooms now. Uh, as Carlton has become a destination, more of a destination spot, um, what ha what has changed in the area? Obviously, we, we, we've talked to people who've been in Carlton a long time, and obviously it's undergone quite a transformation. What are the biggest changes you've seen in Carlton, and, and, and maybe how does that translate to the changes you've seen in the valley in general? Uh, there's more, the wineries were all either in the hills, I think of Dundee, uh, or McMinnville, and sure, there's some in Newburgh and, and, uh, and Gaston, Elk Cove, and Kramer, and all, but there was nothing really going on in Carleton. And uh, Kenwright slash Domain Serene, they were the, the Kenwright made the wines initially there, uh, or at Port, I mean, McMinnville first, then, then, then here. And then, you know, they grew. Domain Serene moved where they are. Kenwright moved a block or so away. And there are more wineries in town. Uh, and then there's also more out in the outskirts, mm -hmm. myself included. I think there's five on this road here now, six counting uh, the Jadot people with uh, residents. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that you look at, there's so much potential everywhere. I mean, look at that hill there. What's wrong with that hill? <laughs> Nothing, you know. <laughs> it's, it's got no trees on it now. Now's the time to plant it, quick. Uh, but you're seeing more and more people move here because there is a town feel to it. When I moved here, there was uh, there was no restaurant in Carleton. 
there was a deli, Main Street Market, uh, affectionately known as To Main Street Market, because you'd get sick about once a month. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And uh, that was it for food. And now there's seven restaurants in Carlton, uh, and, uh, and also a food truck, Thai food truck. Uh, there's, I don't know how many wineries in Carlton, several in downtown Carlton. Mm -hmm. And uh, tasting rooms are, you know, mm -hmm. I think there's 23. Mm -hmm. That's the way I count. But, you know, I'm bad with counting, so you better check on that. <laughs> uh, the, all the storefronts are occupied. There's all sorts of not only wine related things, but other businesses there that are successful. Mm -hmm. uh, some good beer bars. And the gas station is a great example of second generation taking over and saying, we're going to make it more than a gas station. You know, convenience store, beer place, growler filler, burger, breakfast, and they keep on expanding their dining area until you can't get the gas anymore. <laughs> but maybe that's better. Who knows? Yeah. What about the valley in general? Uh, what, 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 uh, what has changed the most in the Lama Valley uh, since you've been here? a good question. Many things. Uh, more roads are paved than when I moved here. Uh, also what I noticed being in downtown uh, Carlton for 14, 16 years, whatever it was, it's a fishbowl. It's all glass, the building. You can see cars going by, trucks going by, and mostly farm vehicles, farm type vehicles. Nothing fancy. Now there's lots of fancy cars. So you're seeing, I guess, more people who have wealth, or at least people have fancy cars <laughs> driving by. <laughs> uh, nothing wrong with fancy cars, and that's fine. I think that also the area is attracting people who are retiring here, mm -hmm. and they have enough money that they can put in a vineyard or put in a winery, and, and uh, so that's, that's, that's the main difference, because mm -hmm. I think when I moved here, everyone that I, that I met was here because they wanted to make wine. Mm -hmm. and. That's what I wanted to do too. You know, I got there in a very slow route. I should have started when I moved here instead of doing the retail thing, but no, that's okay, it all worked out. But I wanted to do that. And I think people that are moving here now, they just want to add that charm to their bracelet. You know, it's, uh, we got a vineyard and a winery up in Oregon or whatever, one of several homes we have. We have. And I don't know if it's good or bad, but uh, I think it's, it's uh, there are things being built which are, more akin to country clubs than they are to wineries and, and vineyards. And is that a good thing or a bad thing? I don't know. You know, It's just the evolution of what happens, I think. What about as you look ahead for, for Carlton and, and for, the, for wine and, and Oregon in general, what do you see happening in the next five, ten years? Uh, the next thing is going to be the media and the buyers will wake up and go, Oregon Chardonnay is amazing. It's way better than anything else on the market, including Burgundy. And Burgundy is its own thing, but I think Oregon Pinot is going to appeal to more people because it'll be more affordable <laughs> than Burgundy, for one thing. Uh, but it has longevity. It's got nice acidity. It's got good enough fruit, and depending on how you make it, uh, you, can, you can get minerality by either the way you farm it or how long you have an elevage. Mm -hmm. uh, I've done very well with the critics with my Chardonnay and when they ask how I make it, I say I do as little as possible and just keep my eye and nose on it on a regular basis. Make sure it doesn't go the wrong way. And, and, uh, it works. I think having good fruit is everything. And the other thing, what I also what I, moved, what I learned when I moved here is you're not a good gardener. You're blessed with great weather, and that's 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 what it is. <laughs> and you kind of go, "Oh, I'm the best." No, so you got you have the perfect environment. Yeah. You talked a bit earlier about uh, the pandemic we're in the middle of right now, and and how it has changed other people's business models more than perhaps yours. Um, what effects have you seen from it, and has it changed your perceptions of the next couple of years for Oregon wine or for yourself? Oh yeah. Uh, distributors, for the most part, and I do have some that are viable, that 5%, uh, they have been proactive in, in letting me know that, you know, 80% of their restaurants are 
either done or still closed or the goods going through inventory that they have. Uh, and also other distributors that uh, are being proactive, they say, we're not gonna buy anything. Mm -hmm. We're just gonna deplete what we have in inventory. Mm -hmm. And year one may be gone, but we need to preserve our capital because we don't know what's gonna happen. And so there's so, there's a huge unknown. Uh, and that's, that's a problem. Uh, I'm about 60, 40, 60% direct, 40% distribution. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's gonna be a problem, but, uh, uh, the biggest problem I see is if Kate shuts down Oregon again or pulls the reins back or whatever, tourists are what drive most wineries net if you can even make a net income. And it's because they come here, they have a great time, and, and they usually buy cases and cases of wine. Mm -hmm. And we need to get the tourists back. and. I've got 11 appointments between now and the 17th of July, which is fantastic uh, for me. I only do two tastings a day, so it's, it's, it's good. But most of them are brand new people, so I don't know if they're gonna buy big or go, hey, that was great fun. <laughs> you know, can we come back and just hang out? No, gotta spend some money. But yeah, it's, uh, that's what I'm worried about, if what, what we're gonna see mm -hmm. uh, this year. And it's worrisome, but you know, so is you don't know if a meteor is going to hit us either. So you can't be worried about death or anything negative because it does you no good. Just keep on going. How much wine are you guys buying today? Case each, right? <laughs> at least, at least. <clears throat> uh, you talked about. Uh, wanting to perhaps branch out into, into, into a different varietal, into Cab Franc or something like that down the road. What else, as you look ahead for yourself, do you have other plans in mind, uh, projects, growth? Uh, what, what, do, what do you kind of oh, yeah. see for yourself for the future? So this project here, this little winery you're in, the original plan for this building was to be over-vintaging of wine that you have in for more than 12 months. Also equipment storage when the season's over and a cold room to put fruit in in case we have a vintage like 03 where everything was 100 plus degrees and you got to chill, pick and then chill it down. The real winery is going to be right across the driveway uh, on that pond mm -hmm. right next to it and it's already plumbed in and the power is already set. But when we built this, we had to level it out and do some excavation and the plan was to go down I think 18 inches and make it level. Well we hit not only clay but water, so this whole hill has five springs on it. <laughs> one, one of the springs was going right underneath construction site. So when you drive over it, it would call, it was called pumping. So in between the giant dump trucks that were bringing gravel in, wheels, the earth would come back up, like you're driving on a waterbed. Mm -hmm. so like, oh, <laughs> what do we do now? So you stopped everything and you go, well, you can move the construction site. No. Or we can dig down until we hit, you know, go deep enough and then bring back in rock and build it up. So you're sitting on top of six feet of rock underneath this building. So we had to haul away, I don't know, 70 dump truck loads of dirt and then put in drainage so we could build here because it was raining during the fall of 16 and spring of 17 mm -hmm. uh, and to run all the water around it and then build it back up again. So that blew my budget for the entire winery. So the real winery was gonna be enough to partner with somebody and have them make wine here with me, or maybe three or four wineries, and then have them, you know, be like an incubator. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You can be here five years and then fly little bird, you gotta leave the nest. Uh, and so that didn't happen because once again, running out of money. Uh, but it's all ready to go, in case you wanna invest. It's right there. But uh, I might do that, depending on how things happen in, in the next couple of years. Mm -hmm. uh, I've got, 40 acres here, plantable and ready to go is about 11. Uh, if I cleared that up over there on the south side, it's another five acres. So there's plenty of ground. I cut down trees, I can get another 10. I like the trees, they protect me from prying eyes mostly. <laughs> uh, but yeah, there's plenty of land to plant here. The east side is prime, the south side not so much, but it may be, you know, uh, maybe growing Syrah here pretty soon in Zinfandel because Merlot, how about that? Bring that back. Uh, it's getting warmer and warmer, except for this year, so far. 
uh, yeah, that's the plan uh, to keep growing the business piece at a time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think I'd put a I put a couple acres in first before building the winery over mm -hmm. there. Unless I had somebody to say they want to partner, then we can do it. Because right now you can get access to great uh, plants relatively cheap because mm -hmm. that's a long-term process and no one's planting right now. So prices are dropping and you get access to some really interesting uh, clones. So I was going to ask, you had a lot of time, you've had a lot of time to consider this. What would you plant? Uh, years and years ago, decades ago, uh, John Paul over at Cameron, uh, I worked with him and uh, showed me all the different plants that he had and cuttings that he was had there. And you know, he has some really interesting wines, uh, Clolectrique, Rouge, and Blanc. It doesn't say that it's Pinot or Chardonnay, because it may not be, but it's predominantly that. But he's had all these cuttings, and it makes a very uh, distinctive wine. Mm -hmm. And I think that you know, he also is paying attention at his vineyard over there, where it's like these this clone didn't work and take notes and then rip it out and then put in something new or different. Uh, so he's somebody that I have great respect for is doing experimentation there. Uh, a lot of new people are planting tons of different things and they're coming into fruition. You know, Larry Stone and his uh, Lingua Franca, they're doing great work down mm -hmm. there of all different clones that mm -hmm. are working, seemingly working out well so far, but you know, they're not, they're not really into the ground deep enough yet to really determine uh, what's happening. And that's something that I'd like to Pursue would be like one, one acre of Chardonnay, one acre of Pinot, all different clones. That, that's your two experimental blocks, and just see what happens. Mm -hmm. But make wine off of those, you know. And that's off an acre, you can get, I'll call it two tons. That's enough to, for 100, 125 cases. That's fine. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You talked about the the quality of wine in Oregon when you got here versus now. I'm curious, uh, what are the what are the contributing factors that you talk about a, th a third being good and a third being bad when you start to now wine being basically all good here or sometimes exceptional. What's the, what are the biggest changes? What are the biggest changes in terms of grape growing winemaking here? Uh, I think it takes a long time to learn how to grow. I, I think it takes a long time to learn how to make wine because you only get one chance a year. I mean, you can do experiments during the year, but it's really hard to keep all the experiments. You know, what really, why did it go that way or this way? Because, you know, the heat got turned up or whatever, it turned down or who knows what happened, but it's really once a year you can figure things out. And so you only have a limited number of vintages. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I think what happened, farming the same kind of thing. That's even longer term, I think, if you prune a certain way or trellis a certain way, mm -hmm. what does it work? Look at Veronique Duran and what they did with their dense planting. And they, and they had it for so many years and said, it doesn't work, mm -hmm. took it out. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's a huge expense, but hey, a very good, way to learn mm -hmm, you know mm -hmm. it takes, took us like 20 years to figure that out uh but i think what has helped here is that the, once again the people being helpful to, each, to one another and then having businesses that supply things because when i moved here there weren't the ets labs wasn't here now we have three labs you know enological labs mm -hmm. to help you with work i don't have a lab here and i send everything out sure it's expensive but a, they're going to do it right, not me. And then uh, B, I don't have time. You know, I'm making the wine. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't have a staff to run over here, run over there, or do this test. Uh, also, equipment. You have equipment suppliers here now. And before, you didn't. Mm -hmm. uh, I was just down in Texas in January before the virus in a wine country there and meeting with winemakers and all. And they've, they're, they don't have but one supplier of equipment there mm -hmm. and the equipment that they have is it's not high grade and you have whatever the person's supplying and mm -hmm. sure you can get on the phone and call up the people at trans store or buker or euro press and they'll get one for you but you don't have anybody there to mm -hmm. hold your hand or help you and to show you what see what this thing does let me show you what this does mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. so and you have to go to the big shows which i sure is not a problem now with more money coming in but at the time when I moved here, there wasn't big money in Oregon. It was just people that they wanted to make wine. Mm -hmm. And I had, I thought I had enough money. <laughs> I was wrong. But that's, you know, kind of what happened. Yeah. So if someone comes to you today and says they want to get into the Oregon wine industry tomorrow, what's, what's your, what are your words of wisdom for them? I would say what aspect of it, you know. Uh, and if they want to get in, you know, have a vineyard, a winery, and the whole thing. 
I, I would say make sure you have a place to sell it. And I don't mean friends and family. I mean, do you have uh, a brother-in-law that owns a restaurant group or uh, a sister-in-law that might have a distributorship, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. well, alcohol distributorship? And that's, you know, it's how you look at because there's an economy of scale and uh, it's, it's a stair-step business. So the equipment I have, I could make 5,000 cases easily with this equipment, but I couldn't sell that many. Mm -hmm. But the cost of the equipment's the same. So once you go above, let's call it five to 6,000, you need different equipment and that costs more money, mm -hmm. but then you have to have more demand. And so you have to kind of keep on going up the stair. Uh, and I was taught, I'm not gonna name who said this, but uh, a long time ago, and uh, I believe it. They said, no matter what wine you're making, Chardonnay, Pinot, Cabernet, you know, whatever variety you're making, you cannot make a compelling wine if you're making more than 5,000 cases of it. And I said, why? And they said, there's not enough time. Hmm. And I was like, what, I, what do you mean? They said, you need fermentation of a certain size. Someone has to smell those daily, taste them daily as they move, and you get pellet fatigue. And then once they're finished and go into barrel, only one person can taste, because no matter how good all of our palates are, they're all different. Mm -hmm. You mm -hmm. can't taste by consensus. Well, you can you end up with lowest common denominator wines. You end up with things like Miomi, you know, that appeal to a broad audience, but are they good? No, but that's not the point. The point is to appeal to a broad audience. So mm -hmm. that's, you're gonna make those kind of wines. But you want something interesting, something that's complex, something that has beauty and that has the ability to age, then it's, you can't, you can only make so much. Mm. And uh, it's true. Yeah, I've seen it happen with lots of wineries. Like, wow, they're making great wine, and all of a sudden they're making 10, 20, 30,000. Where, where's, the, where's the nuance? Where's mm -hmm. the complexity? Mm -hmm. yeah. It's an interesting point, and we haven't actually heard anything quite like that before. It's an inter interesting number, and obviously a lot of Oregon wineries fit in that size and, and below. Um, when you talk about complexity, nuance, things like that, I'm curious how how do you define that? How do you define a complex wine versus a non-complex wine? Uh, number one, I would uh, focus on aromatics. And, and when you open it and pour it, it may have one or two components you can pick up on. Uh, and then with time, and I don't mean five minutes, with 30 minutes in the glass, the, the aromatics will have totally changed. And it's, the wine's alive and getting more air to it, it's breathing faster, therefore it's actually dying faster, but that's another story. Uh, and then another hour, it even smells more different. And the same thing with taste. When you first open it and pour it and drink it right away, well, at any time, I'm sure it'll be pleasant, but it's gonna have one or two flavors, uh, nice enough texture. And then over 30 minutes, you try it again, you're gonna have more flavors emerge and they go from let's call it fruity to earthiness over time mm -hmm. as you know the good analogy is like a, a plum you get a plum when it's almost ripe it's bright it's crisp it's crunchy uh, it's juicy it's good and then you get it perfectly ripe it's got sweetness and savoriness at the same time and it drips over the place with a huge mess when you let the, the plum sit there long enough it turns into a prune still mm -hmm. good but the flavors totally change mm -hmm. yeah Interesting. All right. That's all the questions that I have for you. Is there anything, anything I didn't ask that I should have? Anything we didn't cover today that we should have covered? No. Oh, good, good. All right. Yeah. Well, thank you so much Thanks. for your time, for your stories, sure. for your history, and uh, for some good laughs, too. <laughs> <laughs> we'll go ahead and let you off the hook. Good. Good.